And we are recording. And thank you very much, Michael, for agreeing to give the Build a Cell seminar, and it's all yours. Great. Uh, hi, my name is Michael Booth, uh, and I'm a Royal Society University Research Fellow at the University of Oxford. And so today, what I'm going to talk to you about is some work I've done over the last six years, seven years, I don't remember anymore, I think seven years, on creating synthetic tissues and being able to control them with different types of stimuli uh, and, and why that's interesting. And so it's all work that I did uh, before I became independent now uh, in the group of uh, Professor Hagen Bailey when I was a, uh, a junior research fellow. So this is the group and the and these are the two people I want to thank at the beginning, and I'll thank different people at the end. So, I'll hold your horses. So, uh, uh, Florence and, and Vanessa uh, are two people who's, who uh, I helped and, and did some work with. Uh, Florence is actually my, my first PhD student joint with Hagen. Uh, and I'm going to show you some work from, led by them that I helped out with as well along the way. And, and no, Hagen doesn't uh, do child labour. So, synthetic biology. I don't really need to use it too much to you guys, but this is what I actually love this figure from, from Death Wilson and Chris. Uh, and it's a bit looking at something in terms of in compartments and complex compartments and how to how to make them and, and the different ways people can make them. So for instance, we can start from complex cells uh, and trying to engineer. Or people can start from very simple components, like we had from Lee Cronin a few weeks ago, and design complex systems. Uh, and there's kind of an in between, just in like the stuff that I'll try to do as well. Uh, and then normally, what we've been focusing on is, is single compartments uh, and using those. Where what I've been doing is working on networks of compartments. Uh, Breaking up a lot. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll stop my video. Hopefully, that'll make me get faster. Hopefully, it's getting better now that I've uh, turned my video off. So, there's different ways of making compartments. Uh, and what I'm doing is making networks of compartments. And there's lots of different reasons for doing this. Uh, there's lots, lots of. Uh, great. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, <laughs> So there's some different reasons for doing this. Things like uh, creating life, which a lot of people make while you work on less so for me. There's also things like creating bioreactors or, or things for drug delivery and cell repair. So compartments. So obviously the archetype compartment is a single compartment life zone. We have a single goodbye layer, and then you can put drug molecules in, you can change the membrane, you can add things to the lipids and things like that. Uh, and I hope you guys can still hear me, so it's very badly breaking up, but we'll keep going. And so there's lots of different applications for these. So again, things like uh, drug delivery, and again, so things like biosensors and, and cell mimics. And what the types of things I work on, again, are, are moving between the cell mimics and this kind of drug delivery type thing. Uh, and there's also other types of compartments, which is worth looking at. So what I'm focusing on more than just these single compartments is these multi-compartment structures, so these droplet interface bilayers. And so what I'm going to do is, is most of you might not have heard of them before, so I'm going to give a, a, a quite an introduction to, to them to explain how they differ. So here we have single compartments in aqueous droplets in oil, with lipid in the oil. And then you form lipids on the a lipid monolayer on the outside, and then you can bring these together. So what you're forming is these compartmentalized systems where there's different components in each droplet. And these have extra advantages over single compartments. You get, uh, for instance, things like you can make tissue mimics, you can make soft robots. Uh, and the, the advantages come from the fact that you've got this, you can get communication between the compartments, which is the, uh, a theme you'll see throughout. And you can also get then uh, multiple functions from having the multiple compartments. And also you can think about droplet pathing, which is what something I'll talk about as well. Uh, and it's worth noting this protein, which uh, will come up multiple times, alpha hemolysin. It's just a, uh, most, most of you might know about it. It's, uh, it's used in membrane studies a lot and, and single compartment stuff as well. It's just a, 
a protein pool made of seven monomers. Uh, and you see one of the monomers in red. And it just forms a hole in a bilayer. So the bilayer goes here, and it just forms a hole for ions and small molecules. And so this was pioneered by, by Hagen back in 2005. There's other people doing it now. Uh, but I wanted to talk about some of the first uh, interesting applications that Hagen worked on. This is obviously this is before me, before I started working on it. And so one was a, a bio battery, so you can create these systems, these compartments. Each of these is a droplet and a bilayer in between, and you can put electrodes in the droplets. Uh, and then if you have a salt gradient uh, with a with a hemolysis mutant in the, uh, the bilayer, you can then get a voltage being generated. So if you have an anion selected in these membranes and then a gradient of, of salt and only the, the core will move across the membrane and so you generate a, volt, a, a current here which you can then see by just attach the droplets to then reduce to zero. Another one is a, is a full way rectifier so using again uh, some of pore this time it's, it's a positive pore and by using uh, fancy ways of connecting the droplets you can get a, a, a bio-forming, so when you uh, a voltage positive or negative, you still get a positive voltage from that watt. So it's just a really interesting first generation uh, functional drop-in network. There's a couple different ways of making them. So most of my work is just making them either manually or, uh, as we'll see on the next page, uh, next slide, uh, with a 3D printer. So he just, what I normally do is put them in a well, and you just use a, a, a house and pipette or a uh, it's a normal pair. You can also do microfluidics, this is an artist from the artist says group with Ivala Laney, who's not independent. And this is uh, another one from the success group with a using an optical trap to then uh, make these drop networks. And this is one from Hagen's lab that I've used having up particles to then move and make them. There's all different ways of making these drop networks. And this is uh, one of the ones that we mentioned uh, the first half of the talk quite a lot. And so here that uh, a previous history student in the Haynes group made a 3D printer. So here, what you have is you have an oil bath that contains the lipid. Uh, and then you have this on top of a, a stage that can move the dependent on a computer program. And into, the, into that oil, you have these nozzles, these glass nozzles, you can see a picture here, with the piezo lift uh, from the oil bath. Uh, so just create, when you've got a voltage across it, it just then uh, Beat and then it gets a peak of these droplets in the end. And then these form a monolayer, and then you can build up uh, lots of networks of hundreds of thousands of, of droplets. And so, with two models, you can then generate all sorts of interesting architectures based on those two, and putting it layer by layer on the computer program. So, two of the cool things from this paper that I really like uh, is generating here. So, this is showing how accurate and, and interesting the visual printing is. So here you can generate uh, this structure inside uh, inside the dropping network. And so if you look from the side, you see the one, two, or three uh, in Roman numerals. And here again, looking at the salt concentration, what also happens with the salt concentration is to get water moving across the bilayer to balance the salt concentration. And so here what Gabriel did is he printed two layers in, in petal shape. Uh, with the low concentration salt at the top and the high concentration salt on the bottom. And so what happens is the water moves from the high concentration salt uh, into the low concentration, sorry, the other way around. <laughs> water moves from the low concentration salt into the high concentration salt. And this then means it folds up as the outside droplets get bigger and the inside droplets get smaller. So what you end up forming is uh, something you'd never be able to 3D print in the first case. So a hollow sphere. So that's, that's when I joined the group and I, I wanted to do some, some work on synthetic biology. Uh, and what, what I wanted to do was then create functional networks. So we could, we could make them fairly well now. We could make you know, interesting three-dimensional structures. But can we actually do interesting things and control them interestingly? So that different types of inputs. It could make different types of outputs. So I'm going to talk today about, about using light mostly, but also a little bit using temperature uh, and some work at the end using using chemicals and doing all sorts of things for instance movement or generated signals uh, or, or releasing small molecules as well. There's some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. 
So this then moves on to how we can then turn these from droplet networks into synthetic tissue. The idea was to bring in some actual minimal biological function. Uh, and then so what we did was we, we used the Pure Express system. So just uh, in vitro transcription condition where you can have a minimal set of components to go from DNA to RNA protein. And so this is just nice figure showing the interactions that are happening within the transcription translation system. I just love breaking up again. It's okay. Maybe what I'll do is I'll move this. That's a little bit better. Uh, okay. So the idea was that I'm from a nucleic acid background, and so the idea was to try and get control into the system by actually modifying the DNA. And so there's a number of different ways that people have modified DNA before. And so uh, this is just a couple of examples. So you can add azobenzenes into the backbone to get control of transcription. Uh, and you can see it, it works fairly well. It's nice if it's reversible, uh, but it's still got quite a uh, high off state. You still get transcription in some more from the off state. Here's a nice one that uh, well, was presented uh, from Ali a couple of months ago in the build itself. So he's actually used his backbone modifications to make cells. Uh, and it works quite well, but still, this, this background signal with, with no light for generating protein. Uh, and there's also another example here where you can do the water grip face and modify that. The problem with that, uh, the, the good thing about that is you get a really good off state. The problem with it is that it's very difficult to make from templates because you can't use this in the style that we do. And so, what I developed in my own hard wire for the DNA, where we were modifying not the Watson group phase, but the, but the from major groove. And so you can buy amino DNA fairly simply. Uh, and then this, this actual molecule here is commercially available. So what we can do is just in one step take this molecule where we've got a photocleaval group that uh, feeds back to the ink here, and then buy it in, uh, on the end, which we can bind to a in. And so what we did is we had seven of these across a T7 promoter. And then bound each one of them to a monovalent check algorithm. And so what it did is it ended up blocking the transcription because uh, the T7 polymers couldn't bind until we then shone light on this. Uh, and then it cleaves back and it allows transcription translation. And so this works quite well. So this, this is it's made fairly simply. And you just have to step to combine DNA with amines in it. Uh, so it's just a headless trace. You can do the reaction. And then you get a fairly good yield of the final product, which you can purify with HPSC. And you can use that as a CR primer to generate any gene of interest. And so this is why it's quite nice, is that you can just use it as a primer to amplify anything. And so from one action, you can then generate lots of different types of the in the product. It works really well. You get more than 99% uh, off on ratio. So this is the system we made uh, with the MVS protein, the and protein, and just do the pure grass. Uh, and you get a very similar negative to no DNA without light. When you shine light, you get a really good off state. That's uh, similar if you didn't have if you didn't shine light, if you didn't have the light in the first place. So the next thing we'll put is two droplets. And so here you can see two droplet systems, just very simple handmade droplets. Uh, and we've got like the name of the surface expression system inside them. If you don't push on light, nothing gets expressed, just background, uh, background noise to bar. Still bad. Anyone still having else problems? Yeah, I, um, uh, okay. Still problems. Okay. Yeah, I hear about half of what you're saying in the last few minutes. Oh, I'm just, I'm just, oh. Okay. 
Yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? Okay, let's try and... If I play this a second... Oops. And then I will take this away, and then I will play this I don't use these screens. Um, it can be enough. Am I uh, any better with my internet? Um, maybe. Yes. And now, can you hear me somewhat? Or I can't really hear you, so that's probably the problem. Hmm. Can you dial in by the phone? I don't know how that, don't know how that works. Let's see. How, how does that work? As in, that's so, what you mean. As in, uh, log in as the phone. That's what you mean. So you call this number. This is the UK number I found. And this is meeting ID. And there's no password. Okay, great. I'll, download, I'll do that. Sorry, everybody. Oh, that, now you sound perfect. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think it was just the two screen thing then. Oh, no, I think it's no problems. I can't really hear you very well. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm having, you're, you're cracking up, so that's probably means that my internet's cracking up. Still a bit robotic, thank you. Mm. Okay, meeting ID. Hello? Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, perfectly. Excellent. There you go. All right, I'm on the phone. <laughs> okay, great. That's, uh, okay, great. Oh, why am I? Turn my volume off. Yeah, so you can hear me now, right? Yes, perfect. Loud and clear. Unfortunately, I can still hear myself because my computer's stupid. I've got an idea. I know what I'll do. Okay, now it's a bit better. Can you hear me now? Yep, perfect. Okay. Should I go back a little bit or should I keep going? Maybe if you can go back a couple slides because I missed the last I'll I'll I'll, I'll start I'll start at the at my stuff. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Sorry everybody. Hopefully you can hear me now. Uh, just shout if you can't. Uh, okay, so so what I tried to do is to generate light-activated DNA, so a really uh, very simple but very effective way of controlling transcription translation uh, with light. And so what I did, let's go to pointer, is to generate this this light-activated DNA. So we have a modified thymine in the backbone with an amine coming out, and then you can react this in one step to create uh, a nitrobenzene. Uh, for the cleavable linker uh, with the biotin. And so we put seven of these into the T7 promoter. Uh, and then what happens is when you, uh, this, this then will block, when you've got monoventure of Davidin on top, you also block transcription. And when you shine light, this then cleaves back to the amine here, which is very, very minimal scarring. Uh, and then it allows transcription and translation. And so this works really, uh, sorry, no, I forgot that again. So this, the, the, way this, the way you make this is just very simple. You, you can buy the DNA in, you do one step reaction, you get a really good yield of the final product that you can purify and just use that as a PCR primer to generate uh, any gene of interest. And then all you have to do is uh, buy and strip that and you've got that DNA. So it works really well. So you get a very minimal uh, off state. So the, the, the light DNA without UV is, generates almost as no protein as, as no DNA. 
Uh, but whereas when you shine light, you get almost the same as you do if you didn't have the light to in the first place. Uh, and so it's, it's a really nice, uh, not, not greater than 99% off-to-on expression. And so we put this into droplets, uh, even though you didn't know you had the <laughs> intro to droplets, so that's fine. You, you, you'll, you'll get a lot of droplet work as I go, so I'll, I'll explain it as I go. So you have these droplets in a lipid oil, uh, and you can then bring them together and you form a lipid bilayer between the droplets. And so when we put lactate in the self expression system into the droplet network, into these droplets, uh, if you don't shine light, then you get very little to no expression, uh, as you would expect. And, uh, and uh, as the other data shows, this is background noise from the self expression system, really. And when you shine a light, you then it again turns on and you get the expression. You get a nice amount of expression protein being generated. Uh, the thing that really made this work really well is adding pegylated lipid into these droplet bilayers. So obviously, a self expression system has, has lots of proteins in it, and it makes bilayers very unstable, especially when they're this big. Uh, and so adding the pegylated lipid uh, really helps stabilize the bilayers. Uh, and it's something people use a lot in, in vesicles anyway to stabilize vesicles to, to, to blood and things like that. So this is really well tightly regulated in, in these droplets. And so we then express the hemolysin protein. So this is hemolysin protein, but tagged with GFP. And then when we express that with light, you could see that you only saw uh, protein at the, at the membrane when you shine light. You don't see anything without it. And you can then this, this is really nice because you can you can then turn it around and you can actually image the bilayer uh, with that way and, and you can see again only see the spike at the bilayer with UV. And so then we we moved to using the three printer, which some of you may have heard <laughs> uh, earlier. So all you do is you you have a a nozzle that prints these t collated droplets into a, a patterned array based on a two dimensional uh, layer by layer printing. And so, again, as with the other droplets, if you if you don't shine light with the self-expression system, you don't get any expression happening. So there's no protein being expressed. But when you do shine light, you get protein expressed in all the droplets the, the same. So it shows that the, both the printer is working really well for the self-expression system, but also the light penetrates the network really well to, to, to turn it on. So if you, can, you do the same thing, but without vitamin A, again, as you'd expect, you you get the same expression in either one, so showing that there's a little to no damage being occurring on the DNA or the self-expression system. And so you can then use the printer to pattern interesting structures. So this is just a pathway, three-dimensional pathway through the network uh, with either no DNA or didactivated DNA. You then shine light, and then you can get this pathway being, uh, being the only thing that expresses the protein. And what you can do is you can put electrodes on this to then, uh, with, with, with the hemolytin, hemolytin protein that I explained before that permeabilizes membranes. So only the, the droplets in this pathway should express. And that's what happens. So when you put electrodes across and you put a voltage, you only see this current being produced when you've got the electrodes on the pathway. If you put the electrodes off the pathway, or either the top or the side, then you don't get any current being formed because uh, only those droplets are expressing. And so that's interesting from the printer side, but from the light side, you can also pattern. And so here now is a droplet network where all the droplets contain light out of DNA. So all of them have the potential to express, but only if you shine light on this pathway, does the pathway express and you don't get an expression off pathway. And so you can do the same thing with the hemolysin. So if you, if you have the whole droplet network with hemolysin in there, then you shine light to create this pathway and then you do the electrode uh, test again and you put electric to the, the pathway and you see the current. If you put it off pathway, you don't get anything. And because the light penetrates the whole network, you then get it on the top as well. And so because we're patterning with light and we've got droplet compartments, we can also just pattern single compartments. And so here's a nice example where you can just have a whole network but only activate two single droplets in the network uh, or a pathway or a smiley face as, as everyone does. So you can also pattern to different extents inside the droplet and, and generate different amounts of protein by by activating the DNA to different ex, different extents. And so you can either have have no 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 illumination, which generates no protein, or, or different amounts of illumination to generate different levels of protein. So this is it's really nice because now we're not going we're not going to the just the two different types of droplet network. We've got we've got more than that. And so we also put 
reversible photoswitchable proteins into the network as well. And so here uh, is a paper from 2010 where they had this reversible RFP. Uh, and we just showed that that worked just as well in droplet networks. So you can express this protein in, in these compartments and just turn it off with yellow light and turn it on with blue light. And you can keep going on and on and on. And with that, then you can pattern as you wish as well so with the protein rather than with the DNA. So here, just a single compartment, you can then turn it, turn it on and off or turn everything off and just one on as, as this, the blue line shows. So you can pattern things like uh, O and X as you would as someone from Oxford. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, a work led by Vanessa. So she's also trying to pattern, uh, to trying to control drop networks with light. But in this case, she's using a bacteriodopsin protein, which pumps proton, protons across a membrane under, under green light. And so some of the early work she showed is that if you just, uh, you can have a droplet pair, each with electrodes in, to measure the current across the bilayer. And if you have the bacteriodopsin in the membrane, you can then generate this current being formed without putting a voltage across the droplet, the electrodes uh, under green light. And so what you what what she saw there is is a biopixel, right? So it's a pixel that's detecting light. So you've got this off signal versus an on signal. So she generated this array. So this is a hydrogel background background with uh, 16 droplets, each connected to an electrode. So this is the, the side view of what it looks like. So you have these hydrogel uh, wells with a lipid bilayer from the droplet to the hydrogel and then electrode in each of the bottom and then a, a common ground to the uh, to the hydrogel. And this is what it actually looks like. So a lot of electrical engineering she had to do to do this. So it's very impressive. And so this is what it looks like from the top. So you can see each of the purple droplets. Uh, and then when you shine light, again, so you get these is it on the signals for each of the droplets? Uh, and so you can see that when it's all illuminated, you get above the, the, the background noise of, of the, the, the droplets, the biopixels. And so by putting photo masks on there, you can then use it to visualize moving images. So she did a, a game of Tetris on there. So you can have the one image moving down and then a second image moving down and then they move both together. So that's a really nice example of, of being able to detect with, a, with soft components. So it's a nice little video, which I can't seem to play, but it's pretty much just doing that. I'll maybe play that at the end if I've got time. Okay, but what was really interesting is that the response from the droplets was actually linear. And so you could calibrate each pixel to then detect grayscale. And so you could then have these uh, photo masks, which were grayscale detecting. And so you could detect uh, fairly well the the extent to which your your photo mask was was patterned. It was a, was different levels of grayscale from from 20 to 100 percent. So it was it's quite a nice example of the of a, of a soft retina where the hard components are only there to measure it. It would still do everything it does even without the hard component. And so all of that work was in with an oil, but obviously ideally we want to move these systems into water. And so there are a couple of examples of people moving these things into water and that's what I'll explain. And then some of the work that I've done and then one of the one of my students has done as well with, with Hagen. And so these droplet networks in aqueous environment uh, can be made in multiple different ways. And so here's two examples from, from Gabriel, uh, again, the, the same person who did the droplet printer, where he generated a, an oil droplet and then put water droplets inside there and so the oil still contained lipid. So it had a lipid monolayer to the external solution and then lipid monolayers to uh, internal droplets. So you contain bilayers uh, between the internal droplets uh, and to the external solution. Uh, and so this example from Oscar Says Group, and again, Yuval Laney, who's now uh, independent, who did uh, a similar thing uh, with gravity centrifugation. Uh, and then there's other examples with Wilhelm Mark and Oliver Castell, who have done this type of system, but uh, with Max Hudix. There's also much earlier versions called depot foams, which, which people can look up if they want. Uh, but what you need to do here is you need to be able to selectively and reversibly permeabilize different membranes. Because obviously, if you have hemolysin in these droplets, it's going to permeabilize both membranes and everything's just going to leak out instead of actually doing anything interesting inside before you do anything outside. And so, what the work I was doing in, with these systems was to try and actually do that, was to try and 
permeable layers, the internal membranes, but uh, block the external membranes so that we can do something interesting inside. So this is the system I, I generated. Uh, so it's the system where we have this bulk aqueous and oil, and then the DNA and self-expression system with a, a beta galactidase to uh, react with a, a protected molecule in, a, in a, a secondary compartment. And then there's internal bilayers and external bilayers. And, and zinc outside, which are, I'll explain why that's the case in the next slide. So these are what they actually look like. So you have this silver wire, which we just used to, to hold the oil droplet in, in the air, uh, and then in the water, sorry. And then you can create compartments inside there just by hand. Uh, and then we form the bilayers between them and the bilayers to the external solution. Uh, there, there's, there's, ways of, there's other ways of making these, which are a bit, maybe a bit prettier, but I didn't care so much about pretty, I cared more about function. Uh, and this is a very simple way of making them, just show that as the case. And so you, what happens is when you self-express the protein, which I'm going to describe on the next page, this inserts into both the bilayers, but it's a metal sensitive one. And so it blocks when it, re uh, it sees zinc, but it doesn't block when it doesn't see zinc. And so you get molecule moving through, reacting inside, so you get an internal reaction where a product is only released if you then chelate the external metal. So this is the, the protein I, I found. So I went back into the literature of Hagen's papers because he was uh, initially uh, actually a membrane protein expert, well, he still is, but an, an engineer into membrane proteins was his major major thing. And so he previously formed this protein called Hamelitin 4H, where there was zinc binding site at the end of the barrel. So this is these four zinc sites. And so if you formed the homohectomer where all seven of the monomers had this histine site, then with zinc, Again, this is a electrophysiology recording. So you don't get any current being produced because it's completely blocking the, the pore. But when you're AGTA, you open up the pore. So this has been used with cells, uh, which is really nice. So you can actually then control the permeability. So this is just looking at cellular permeability and, and showing that if you have uh, hemorrhage, this is H5, H5, so there's actually a worse version of 4H that needs uh, a higher concentration of zinc. So it's actually it's even better than this one, really. And so here you can have the, the zinc and EDTA in the, in the external solution, which means that the cell is still permeable because the zinc's being chelated. Whereas if you just have the zinc, it's blocking to the same amount as if you didn't have the protein in the first place. So it's a really nice way of reversibly permeabilizing. So it also shows that the, the conditions used for this protein are cell compatible. So what we did to start with is just to prove this point in, in droplets in oil. And so we have this, these three compartment systems where the, the middle compartment contains the DNA for 4H, it in hemolysis in 4H and self-expression system. And the left droplet contains a fluorescent glucose. And then you have two bilayers and then the third droplet contains zinc. And so what we're expecting to happen is the protein to express, to insert into both bilayers, but only one of the bilayers should be open because one of them contains, the other droplet contains zinc. And this is exactly, and so, this is what we see. And so when we do this expression, after six hours, the fresh and glucose per, uh, uh, equilibrates between the first two droplets, but nothing goes into the third droplet. And then we can leave this overnight and still nothing goes into the third droplet. And so this is just showing how effective this method of control is. And so we can do this in, in multi-zones too, the same experiment, where now we've got the zinc externally instead of in a third droplet. And so we can leave this protein to express and so into both the bilayers. The thrust and glucose equilibrates, uh, as you can see here. Uh, which, and then what we're hoping to see is when we add ETA, we can then release this. And so what we see is, again, we're making these two, these two systems which are the same. We let the protein express and the thrust and glucose moves between the two, but doesn't seem to release. And we'll, we'll measure that accurately in a, in a second. And so when we add buffer, again, we don't see anything changing. We'll leave it for extra time. Whereas if we add a UTA, it then releases. Uh, we, see, we see the release from this one much slower and because these are not super stable structures, uh, I haven't really quantified after too much longer because it's, uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on them. And so what we can do here is we can just take the external solution and put down a perimeter, and that's what we do. And so if we're just looking for released pressing glucose, and so without DNA, which isn't shown here, you, don't, you just get background, nothing happens. Uh, and if you look at the picture, it just stays looking like this. Whereas if you 
had DNA, but don't add uh, EDTA after 18 hours, then you get this system and you don't get significantly anything being released after that extra time. Whereas if you do add EDTA, then you get this massive release, which is greater than 50% of the uh, pressing glucose being released after an extra six hours. So we can then do some interesting things inside. So this is doing an in situ activation. So we've got this bulk aqueous again, but now we've got the, the molecule CUG. So it's just a fluorescent glucose, which is non fluorescent until beta galactosidase cleaves it and forms the fluorescent coma in here. And so we're trying to then do this reaction inside without releasing until we want to release with ETA. And so this is what we do. And so without, again, without DNA, nothing, nothing gets released and, and we don't see any, any fluorescence. With DNA, there's a, a small amount, but not, not too much. And then with DNA and with the glucose clusterase, we see a little bit being released, but this is, this is very minimal. And so again, when we then add EDTA here, uh, we get a nice release, so a really good release compared to the background. And so this is just showing that we can controllably do a reaction inside these multi-compartment structures without releasing anything until we controllably release it. So another project led by uh, Florence, who is a joint student between Hagen and I, was to create structures which were controllable by temperature. And so here, this is what she ended up making. So these droplets contained a pre-gel, which I'll explain what the gel what it is in, in a little bit. And you can make the droplet networks and you can then gel the droplets with UV, which makes it form a continuous structure. So you don't have bilayers anymore. And what this means is you can just add water and you phase transfer directly into water uh, and created this structure. And so what she uses, she used these, these smart materials that have lower critical solution temperatures, so here's polynipan. And what it is is that under 33 degrees, it's soluble, but over 33 degrees, it's insoluble. And so what you can do is you can form the droplet networks in oil. Uh, you can then do the, can do the polymerization, transfer it to water, and you get this continuous hydrogel structure that's the shape of the water. And so these are no bilayers here. But if you have it at lower temperature, you know, lower than the LCST, then it stays as these, these soluble structures and they're fully cross-linked. And the reason you know they're fully cross-linked is because if you heat them up above the LCST, they then contract to form these uh, insoluble uh, structures. And then you can obviously reverse and you go back and forward. Uh, so what she managed to do is to create these, these, change, these chains, which uh, had this curvature being formed with temperature. And so you, what you can do is you can, you can add uh, a cross-linker which increases the LCST so that they don't, they don't contract. And so this is what happens here. So if you have a layer which contracts, you can then have this curvature being formed and you can see the curvature and then re re release. And the reason why this takes so long is because it takes so long to heat and cool water, not actually that the, the night time itself is, is, takes a long time. You can also add golden nanoparticles in here to make them controllable with light and temperature, because golden nanoparticles create heat when they're lighted, when they're illuminated. And so if you have an IPAM chain and a IPAM chain with golden nanoparticles, if you just put it under, under increase in temperature, the whole thing contracts and you can reverse that. And then if you shine light on this, it then curls instead of contracting because only the golden nanoparticles, uh, the droplets that contain them are, are contracting. So she generated some, uh, some really interesting systems where you have uh, both the, the high LCST domain, low LCST domain, and then you can have a magnetic nanoparticle handle. So here what happens is you can heat it up to a high enough temperature that the whole thing contracts. Uh, so you can move it through a small well into a second one. You can cool it down so it can then grab, and then you can then heat it up again, move it into a third chamber, and it relaxes. And so it shows how it's uh, controllable to different extents and, and could be useful for soft robotics or things like this. Uh, and all these things can be varied by vary, varying the types of cost curves and things that you're using. Uh, and the managing bead obviously is really useful because you can then control where it's going and, and how fast it's going. So let's see if this works. If I go back to automatic. Oh, there you go. That's the one. So what you can see is you can see the 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 hydrogel structure contracting over temperature and going to grab this 
this gel bead. And then we'll show on the next slide that she used this to to then move the gel bead around a, a maze. Because you've got this, this magnetic handle here. Okay, so here's this is the case. So we made this maze, uh, or Freud made this maze where you have this this grabber or gripper uh, that's both thermal responsive and magnetic responsive. And so you can you heat it to a high temperature so it gets small enough to come into the maze. You then cool it down and then heat it up so that it will grab the the blob, and then you can then move it with a magnetic handle, uh, release it at another location, and then heat it up again to then release the gripper from the maze. So to switch it up a little bit, what I, I wanted to use two slides just to explain what I'm working on now. It's different to that. Uh, just, just to give you an idea for the build or sell people, the types of things that I'm working on independently uh, that might be useful. So I told about the light up DNA. So what I'm actually doing now is, is changing that to be con hopefully controllable with all different types of stimulus. So other wavelengths of light, things like magnetism and temperature, chemicals and enzymes, and all, all sorts of things. Is, to control DNA and obviously self expression system is a what part of that. And these have all different sorts of uh, advantages. So you have the space temple control for a lot of them. Uh, these are all much less cellular damaging and more penetrating than, than a lot of stimuli and definitely the UV. But you keep this, have to keep this tight regulation. And so what we're doing is yes, we're moving it uh, into show it to work with synthetic cells, like the previous work I've shown, and, uh, and GVs, but also into other types of structures as well and trying to make a really general technology. So with that, I thank my, my current group who are doing all the work uh, and, and, and flows only one that I showed showed work from, uh, but the, also people that are funding me and collaborators. And thanks for your attention and I'll happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, that was really awesome. I'm honestly, I'm jealous myself. I would like to be able to do um, that level of control and that level of organization for um, our dumb liposomes. Um, I'm not, I like that, don't worry. <laughs> I have a kind of a general question and usually people, um, oh, there are some questions in chat, so I think I'll let them go first. I, I can't see them because I'm, I'm only one screen at the minute. Oh, I think you, if you, or I can read it, um, or you can I know, I know, unshare. I know what I'll do, don't worry. I'll, uh, I'll move this into my other screen so I can see it. And I'll leave this up in case we want to, uh, in case we want to do any, oops, it does. Okay. Uh, where is chat? There it is. Does anyone, if anyone wants to just actually uh, turn the microphone on and tell me anything, that's fine. Yeah, if anyone wants to end use mouth, that's fine too, but, um, I oh, I think, oh, I think someone just says they have a couple of questions without giving, a, oh, like oh yeah, Street, yeah, t just speak up if you want to ask some questions. Oh, can we use the mic? Or do yep, we, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. This is this is really cool. I was just wondering, uh, can you also in the droplet interface, can you have asymmetric uh, bilayers? Like, say, if you have those droplets of different lipids. Yes, the question, the answer is yes. And so uh, it's it's worth going it's it's worth going back to why Hagen did this in the first place. So he's a as as I said, like he works on on membrane protein. And so the reason he did this work is so that he could. Uh, measure membrane proteins and so some of the initial work is actually trying to creating artificial membranes with asymmetric bilayers so that you can study different types of membrane proteins in their natural environment okay uh, also um one more uh, so um, i have actually uh, seen these uh, i mean i've read about these droplet interface bilayers being used to achieve near super res because in the evanescent field i think we'll only have two droplets so you have all your focus in a single lipid bilayer and two or three membrane proteins in that so in that case i am just wondering if anybody has looked at lipid dynamics with this because this will be a really really clean system to 
follow lipid dynamics using fluorescence or I mean definitely fluorescence, but maybe also Raman or AFM has that. I mean I'm not yeah, really that, up to date on the field, so has that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, that's a good question. There, there are there are people that are doing that. Uh, uh, less less so. Uh, obviously, obviously, I'm more on the function side. There, uh, there's not really people in Hagen's group, but I know there are people in, in Oscar Cesar's group doing very similar things in London. Uh, and I've seen some papers looking at the dynamics. But there's there, there's there's lots of opportunities that haven't been done on them for that exact reason. Yeah, yeah definitely. There would be a great system to measure those types of things. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. I'll look those up. Thank you. So I, I have a question. The answer probably will be, this is absolutely crazy. Um, but could you, what's the most complex genetic circuit that you could build spread between interacting populations? In, like, could you do- Are you saying in, in one drop in network? Yeah. Like, could you do a couple dozen genes, for example? with some sort of a it's, feedback it's more, between them. It's, it's, more, it's more about what you're moving across the bilayer, right? So you'll, you'll yeah. know this, right? In, in your work, it's about, it's about what are you moving across the bilayer. And, and it's also about, it's, it's the reason why I did that last project in, in, multi, in the droplets and networks in, in water. It's, it, it's, uh, it's being able to control where they're going in the bilayer. In the, in the droplet network is just the Exactly. And, and, that's, and so I guess as soon that, as you have three droplets, then it's even more difficult. Yeah. And they're going, to, they're, going to, they're going to go into all the droplets at one time. Uh, and then, so what do, you, what do you get from that? So a lot of the case, it's about, this, this is why patterning is actually quite interesting, because then you could think about having systems, uh, reactions happening sequentially as you move across rather than uh, just any, anywhere. But as soon as you add the external bilayer, then you get that other difficulty. Yeah. And I guess I, you're probably the best person in the world to answer that question is, what would you speculate? Can we actually build entire metabolism like energy regeneration, gene expression, all the control systems, or is that asking too much? In, in each in different compartments? Yeah. Or... Yeah, split it between different compartments. I, th I think I think the crosstalk will be the thing that, that gets you, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. And and also the 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 fact that everything moves so slowly through through droplet networks at, at the minute, like there might be other ways of moving things and maybe some better pores that make things bigger. But then as soon as you make them bigger, then it may make them much more difficult to control. Yeah. I guess I was hoping you'll say yes. This is totally doable, and I'll get some hope. <laughs> one one um, of the big problems at the minute with droplet networks is their instability, and so there's there's and so this, this is why I, I put Oliver Castell on there. So he's generated the droplet networks in oil through it with a a hydrogel layer, which is really really nice because it improves stability, and you can you can pick them up with a spatula, right? And which is which is really cool. Uh, uh, I went to see him, and yeah, they they're, they're, they're really cool. Uh, but even even those have some some limitations, right? They're difficult to make and things like that. So like it's uh, at the minute there's a lot of engineering things. This is this is why you know the my in my 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 last paper I showed there there are only two compartments and they're only they're only they're only available for a certain amount of time, right? It's still uh, you know over a day, but yeah, there's only there's there's, there's limitations there that need to be on an, the engineering side that need to be addressed. And you have a question in chat. So there's tons of tons of questions in here. Let me have a, let me make sure I get to the most recent one. Okay, Hansa, how do you see this field evolving over the next decade? And what is the time scale on which we can expect the field to generate spin-out technologies? Uh, well, I, I don't see why they shouldn't generate spin-out technologies straight away. That's going to help to to generate more research, right? And because uh, uh, this is the thing, I, I, I mentioned depot phones, right? Just like I, I slotted that in somewhere. That's a technology which is clinically used already for drug delivery, right? And so it's a multi-compartment droplet network, pretty much. It just before that, before those words existed, right? It was in the 90s that they, they generated these. And they're, they're, I don't know if they're still clinically used, but they, they were. 
and it's just for slow drug relief because again it's actually using the using the instability uh, to release drugs slowly and so it's a it's a thoroughly minimal drop network but it it's clinically available so like there there's definitely going to be uh, activity for this you know use for this type of technology uh, Whitfield is it possible to do self expression in pine hydrogels good question there's a lot of work on trying to do self expression in hydrogels uh, some of it uh, and things and things like classic as well uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, in the NIPAM hydrogel itself, not necessarily, I, I don't know, I don't think it worked that well. Uh, there's the, as soon as you, you know, I, I've, I've done it before in, in some thicker, viscous things like thicol and stuff, it doesn't really work at all. Uh, and I, I can imagine PyRPAM will be the same. So I, I think you'd struggle when you start to do it in, 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 in that. Scott. Very fascinating. One question regarding the battery adoption voltage change after light activation. Does the voltage change imply that there is a bias in the channel direction? Mm, yes, uh, it does. It does, but it's 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 only on one side. So it's what it's what it's what that's saying is that it preferentially inserts in one direction, which you would expect, I I, I think, from a membrane protein, uh, especially a bacterial one or archaeal one which doesn't necessarily need the machinery to insert it into itself into a membrane. By the way, if I'm not answering your question well enough, just shout at me. All right, very cool stuff. Have we gained any insight by using these drop-in networks to understand biological processes like embryogenesis, tissue development, or maybe even original life? Definitely not. Uh, this is early stages stuff. This, this, we're nowhere near those type, well, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say nowhere near, but like there's still, as I said, like, there's still lots of fundamental engineering problems that need and 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 more functionality and interesting different types of functionality that you know anyone wants to do you know go ahead and, and try and put it in but it's all about a lot of the i think a lot of the thoughts i've always had on these are why are you doing droplet networks and it's got to be why do, what why do you need multi compartments can you do it with a single compartment because if you can do it with a single compartment do it with a single compartment right uh, have, uh, David, have you ever done tried doing phase transfer on a large DOP uh, drop of tissue to make giant multiple liposomes? Uh, tra transfer on large DOPs. Uh, uh, I, I will say that uh, there is work going on in that area, uh, and it's not my work, so I can't tell you about it. Sweet uh, Tamara, could you control the size too? If you have a big droplet cushioning smaller ones. That trigger membrane fusion and might be a good platform to follow large scale membrane modeling. What about engulfing smaller droplets and bigger ones to generate synthetic cells? I think people, ha I'm sure people have put GVs in, well, people have put GVs inside droplets. The, the, the interesting thing, because it, it, this goes back to a previous question on asymmetric bilayers. So the way you do asymmetric bilayers is instead of putting lipid in the oil, you put the lipid in the droplets. And so if you do GVs, or well, they, they normally do SUVs, because obviously they're much easier to make. If you put one SUV with one lipid in one, it'll form the monolayer around there. And then if you put a different droplet with a different lipid SUV, it'll form the monolayer there. And so then you bring them together and you get the asymmetric bilayer. So obviously the, the problem you're going to have there is, is something that I know some people are, are looking at, is how do you stop the vesicles you have inside fusing with the bilayer or the monolayer. Uh, and obviously a good way of doing that would be to have the bilayer there to start with like you do with nested vesicles, but that's a bit more difficult for how they make it, how, how all the methods are being used at the minute. Uh, did I miss one from there? I don't know, there was about three questions in that one. Control the, by control the size, do you mean the printed droplet size? Uh, or the hand droplet size. I'm not sure. You can you can talk again if you'd like. Yeah. So I, I was myself. thinking if you could. So when you have your droplet interfaces, you have these uh, spheres stacking one on top of another, right? So and usually, 
larger droplets would be floppier, just like, I mean, because there would be less tension, I suppose. So I, I mean, do you, I mean, I don't know. So uh, I don't really know if you can control the size for droplets as specifically as you can for liposomes using extrusion, et cetera. So. Yeah, so with the printer, with the printer, you can get droplets from around, well, so some, of the, some of the latest stuff that I've seen, uh, you can get down to like 10 microns. Uh, it, it's very difficult to print, but you can get down yeah. to that. And the biggest size you can get up to 200 microns in, sure. in diameter yeah. I'm talking about. And so you can yeah. definitely get different sizes. So you could definitely print different size networks together. I just don't, I don't think people have done it because there's not necessarily a reason to do it. Or what, what, what are you, uh, yeah, well, I'm sure there might be, but like, uh, you know, there's only a certain number of hours in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, just something I thought of, I, yeah, makes sense. No, I, I'm sure, I'm sure you could do really interesting things with different size droplets to, I mean, I mean, in case, uh, so if, if it's, sorry, if, if it's actually like you only get, get say tens of microns uh, sizes with the droplets, you might also want, you could, I mean, the smaller versus bigger or the engulfment could in essence also work if you have say LUVs along with those droplets, if you can pack it because LUVs, you can make about hundred nanometers, 200 nanometers in diameter. So that is at least one mm -hmm. order of magnitude less and that that should then work i mean some kind of a hybrid system should work at least on paper yeah it's more on the mechanism how do you expect them to be engulfed and how do you expect them to be engulfed and then keep their bilayer or keep their membrane i mean so if you actually that's, have i'm mean, just thinking off the top of my head here i don't really know the literature about this specifically but if you have say uh, peptides or proteins that could fuse but then, of course, I mean, it will be like a fusion and then a regeneration, if at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matthias. Are there reports, papers about the use of biological systems such as bacteriodopsin voltage change to create electrical circuits and eventually biochips that could be used uh, to feed computer devices? Uh, there, so the work, a lot of work on bacteriodopsin is actually using it on hard electrodes. And so, for instance, because uh, the way you normally buy battery reduction is actually as membrane patches. And so you can layer those on top of like an uh, electrode array. And then, then that can then be used to detect light. Uh, but it's not really used that much. It's not used that well. And I, I think, uh, yeah, not, the, the, the things I've seen are not very good. So, but I, I I've no doubt you could use it much more interesting. And there's lots, obviously, because as soon as we're talking about bacteriodopsin, we're talking about genetics, right? Uh, it's just that bacteriodopsin is an optogenetics protein. So there's tons of proteins that do similar things that, that, that could do interesting things together. Or, or... Any other questions? I think if we have no more questions, thank you very much, Mike. Um, Sorry, Again, everybody, for, for my terrible internet. Now, we made fun of using the phone at the beginning, and now you ended up giving a phone talk. Uh, it really did, yeah. It didn't, it so much, sorry. All right, thank you so much, and uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks Have a great day. Yeah, email me if you want to ask me any questions. I'm happy to answer anything. Bye.